got up before the sun rises because I am just that excited. Hi friends, I'm Quinan. I rant, I ramble, I rarely know what's going on in my life. If that sounds like something you're into, don't be shy, hit that subscribe button. Today we will be discussing a series that I am so excited to rant all of my feelings about and that is the Shades of Magic series by V. E. Schwab. So, if you're not aware, A Darker Shade of Magic is an adult fantasy novel set in a world where there are four Londons. There is Red London, which is blossoming with magic. There's White London, where people are fighting on to the scraps of magic left. There's Grey London, which closely resembles our world today with no magic whatsoever. And then there is Black London, which is forgotten and magic ate away all the people and everything within it. So, A Darker Shade of Magic follows our main character, Kel, who is an Antari, which is a special ability that allows him to travel between Londons. He is a member of the royal family in Red London, but he also has a side hustle, which is smuggling. So our story sets off when he smuggles the wrong thing from one London into another, and it sets off a whole chain of events that starts the Shades of Magic series. If you are looking for a fantastic, probably one of my favorite fantasy novels, this is your go-to. There's an alarm going off in my house because like I said, it's early. I'm just gonna continue. I don't know if you can hear the beeping and if you can, I'm sorry, but wake up because it's about to get exciting. But before we get into that, if you want magic, check. Dynamic characters, check. Low burn romances, check. Do you want a really super awesome coat with magical abilities that you never thought about until now, but it's like the item that you want the most in your life? Check. All of the check boxes marked. This book is five out of five stars. It's so good. It's fast paced. You'll probably get through the whole series in a few days. I know I did. And I know that the only person likely watching this also did too. Amy, hello there. Um, I'm excited to share my thoughts with you and whoever else might have just finished this amazing series. But if you haven't yet, please exit out of the video and come back when you are finished. Um, I'm going to say with the series, I'm trying my best to break it up in between the books, but just in case you don't want to be spoiled, I would say just come back when you're done with A Darker Shade of Magic, A Gathering of Shadows, and A Conjuring of Light, and then we can have a nice rant, rambly discussion. Ready up, let us begin. I have all my notes. And by all, I mean such a small fraction because there is so much to talk about. Let's kick things off with A Darker Shade of Magic. First thing that I will say that I really enjoy this book and I look for in any book with magic is a really structured magical system. And this book had just that. Magic doesn't seem like it comes easily to these people. Frankly, Antari magic is blood magic. Um, that doesn't sound uber pleasant. I don't know about you, but to me, I don't wanna be cutting my hands every 10 seconds. So the magic, it doesn't seem like a crutch. So they have to be really clever in whatever else that they do. And I really appreciated that. It's something that if it's not there, if you have a book where characters have magic and if they have magic, it's like unending magic. That's really fun and that's really cool to read. But in terms of yelling for characters when they're fighting, this book does it really well because you know that every every advance that they're making toward their enemy is taking a toll on them. And so that was something that was really cool. If you couldn't tell by the intro is I am in love with Kel's coat. I think it's such an awesome addition to have in the story, even though it doesn't really hold any significant purpose. It is a continuing motif. And so you have this really awesome, like magical item. And at the same time, you get a sense of continuity between all of the novels. And I really enjoyed that. Some things I want to talk about. First, I love Kel. More than Lila, more than Rye, more than any other character, I love Kel. I think he's just perfect enough that you gravitate toward him. I mean, he's a prince who doesn't love princes, but also at the same time, he's so imperfect, he's so relatable, and I think that adds to his charm. Frankly, this whole story is just because of his mistake with smuggling the black stone in. And I think Kel is just the embodiment of what you want a protagonist to be like. You root for him, but at the same time, you're not 
you're not screaming at him for being utterly stupid, but you're also not bored because he's utterly perfect and does no wrong, and so this is out of character. Everything that Kel does is so in character, and I feel like that's something V.E. Schwab does really well. I feel like she gets a sense of who her characters are, and so consistently, all of their words, all of their actions, throughout all three books, it really follows who they are as a person, and it makes you love them and root for them. So with that being said, let's get into the characters. I've already talked about Kel, so let's go to Lila. Lila Bard, wannabe pirate, she's a thief. I love her. I think that she does have this kind of, I'm not like other girls energy, which is not my favorite. Other than that, I think she's so badass. She goes after what she wants. In this book, we also get the Dane twins who rule white London, and I thought that they were creepy as hell. What they did to Holland, binding him, making him kill all of these people. And then on top of that, what I think her name is Astrid, she did to Rye and she put on the stone necklace and she took him over and then Lila had to stab Rye. I just, I was so shocked. I did not expect that. I did not see it coming. I thought it was so exciting to read, but also heartbreaking because I do love Rye as a character. And when he's explaining why he took the necklace, how it was of his free will, it was just comes back to this idea. That the characters are so dynamic. They are so well fleshed out and V. E. Schwab has an understanding of their motivations and why they do each thing that they do. And because of that, you just root for every single one. And that's honestly all I can ask for in a novel. Some other things to touch on in this book. Lila, she gets the stone from Kel. This is kind of the beginning of everything. And then she's holding it and she makes a duplicate of Kel. And I was just thinking, wow, that's so bold. This is gonna be such a fun novel to read. Anyone who comes encounters like dark magic, someone who didn't know that magic existed before and the first thing that she does is create a duplicate of the only guy who seems to believe that magic exists, who doesn't want to be friends with that or go on an adventure with that person? I don't know. If it's not you, I will gladly take your place. I think that is everything that I want to say about book one that was very not coherent. I'm not going to promise that this video is going to become more coherent because it's not. Book two, this is A Gathering of Shadows. This was a book some people either really love it, some people really hate it, because it is a long book, and yes, I agree, it could be condensed into one novel with a darker shade of magic, but why would you want that? Because A Gathering of Shadows is where all the character building happens, it's where we start falling in love with more people. In this book, we meet Alucard, who is cool as hell, and his relationship with Lila is absolutely amazing. So we learn that Alucard has the ability to see magical threads with people and objects, and I just thought that that was so interesting. I've never seen that power anywhere. It could be because I haven't read a lot of fantasy, but I personally thought that was really creative, and it did add a lot to the storylines. That scene at the beginning where he's seducing Lila and Lila's giving into it comes back to this Kel Lila slow burn that I love and I would die to protect. I was so upset. But then it turns out it was just manipulation, and you know what? I'm okay with that. They got over it, Alucard and Lila are still friends, I, I can get behind it. Let's talk about the meat and potatoes in this book, the thing that everyone is waiting for. The Essen talk, when Kel and Lila unite, and then when Alucard shows up, and we get hints that everyone, everyone, hates Alucard, but then we find out otherwise. It's so exciting, it's so fun. The build-up is amazing. Like, yes, I do wish that Essen Talk was pushed up in the book, but at the same time, I'd say that it's also really well placed in the sense of by the time you get there, you're just so excited to see Kel and Lila reunite, and then you see Alucard and Rai reunite, and it's just, it's beautiful. So we go through, we go through the Essen Talk, and we see Lila starting to come into her powers, and we see Alucard is really, just a magical storm. Then we get to that one fight between Kamarov and Stasian, or the other guy, the dude that Lila's pretending to be that I can't frankly remember the name of. Earlier in the book, we see Lila watching Kamarov fight, and she goes, hmm, that's definitely Kel. We see Kel standing at the balcony, and he's talking, he's talking, he sees someone who vaguely resembles Lila, and then from her point of view, we see her see Kel, and then we find out it's not Kel. So it's just all these near misses and the slow burn romance is just it's too much it's so much to handle uh, because these are characters like i stated before i absolutely love so of course i want them together but in that fight scene before, between cameron and stasian when cal realizes that it's lila and then lila like takes his own magic i think it's fire at the time and uses it against him so we get this really natural loss 
from Kel because one, he's pretty He's protecting Lila, but also at the same time, he's caught off guard. Like, I would say that Lila won that fight pretty fair and square, and it's exactly what Kel needed. Like, he couldn't win another fight because then his mask would have to be unveiled, and it was just such a creative way to solve an issue, and props to the Ishwab. Everything in this book is just creative ways to solve issues. I never felt like, oh, there's a cop-out, and that was something that made reading this series really, really enjoyable. Let's briefly touch on a few characters and character dynamics. I did not like... Rai as much in this book. I know that's a bit of an unpopular opinion, but I love Kel, and it seems like Rai is making Kel's life really difficult with the constant drinking, the going out. I understand where he's coming from. I really like Rai. I just don't love him because it seems like he's being a little inconsiderate toward Kel, someone who gave up his life, and it takes a huge toll on Kel, and I just of course it takes a huge toll on Rai, but at the same time, I just think he could be a little bit better um, about understanding that they're really bonded now and he doesn't need to be getting hung over every single night. But he did come up with this whole scheme with Tiernan and everyone um, to get Kel into the games because it was something he needed and so that, always love Rai for that. So going into Tiernan, I think that he is the best mentor ever. He obviously is housing some secrets for both Rai and Kel and then he houses Lila's secret. He's just so calm and he's so... He's just calm and he's everything that you like expect a master to be but at the same time I do feel like he's a kid at heart and he just resonates with these little kids that he's taught growing up so much and he's never putting them in danger but he also lets them get away with a healthy dose of fun and he's just a wonderful character. Kala as a side character I loved her I love that she shipped Kel and Lila almost as much as I did um, and I really particularly enjoyed that scene where Lila comes in and she's like oh every week Master Kel uh, comes checking to see if you've paid your debt and Lila's like mm, that's rude and so she goes no 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 He's checking to see if you've come back. And then five minutes later, Kel does come back. I thought that was such a treasure of a scene. That about wraps it up for book two, I'm pretty sure. That's where I am. I have a couple other thoughts, but this video is already getting uber long. So, moving on to book three. We see Holland, our homeboy, get possessed again. I feel really bad for him. He's just constantly, his life is never his own. And I think that that's something that makes book three so interesting because he's finally free, or at least as free as he has been in the past 20 or so years when he's with our beloved main characters and they kind of squat up. And so I really like seeing that development through Holland and book three is really where I, he started to grow on me. One thing that I really liked in this book is the idea that not one person can save them. I feel like this is a very common trope in novels where you have a chosen one, you have a hero, someone has to sacrifice themselves for the good of humanity, and this novel didn't really have that. The whole story was them figuring out how do we combine our powers, how do we be strong enough to beat Osaron. We know that most likely one of our characters is not going to die, but at the same time it makes it harder because do we really trust Holland? Do Kel and Lila trust Holland enough? Um, and then at the same time, like Lila just learned how to use magic. How do you work all of this together to create an actual sustainable solution? And so we get the Antari rings and we get all of this stuff, uh, but there's a lot of trust that has to be built there and it allows for the story to be somewhat character driven, um, although it is a fantasy and it has a very great plot. Another part of the solution that I thought was super cool is putting everyone to sleep. It seems like the reasonable conclusion to jump from one to another. If your power source is the people, you don't want to get rid of the people. And so the best that you can do is put them to sleep, unconscious, then Osaran can't take their power. But one thing that I do wonder is how much of this is Osaran needs a power source, how do we get rid of that power source? Versus V. Schwab intentionally making this decision to take all of these people who are infected out of the equation. And so therefore we no longer have to deal with them, but we're, no, we're not left questioning, oh, whatever happened to these rampant people. And so I thought it was such a smart move. Magical ship. Another element of magic that is just so cool to me, they have all of these magical items and we see Alucard, Kel, and Lila all be really, really in love with all these items. We have Maurice, who is the leader of the ship and she's like ancient, but somehow she's still agile. And we find out that she was taking years of life from people, thought that was really cool. I loved how she knew Alucard, then she knew Kel and she offered him the slip of paper and then she offered Lila the black eye. I think Maurice is kind of She's cold, yes, but also at the same time, can we really say she's not rooting for our characters? And then we have Holland with the Antari rings, and they're all testing it out, and Kel's like on the floor, almost dying because Lila's taking all of his power. 
not intentionally. And then he feels this rush of power, and it's Holland. And it's just, I feel like that is when we really knew that these three characters could do it. Yes, they have the means, they have the Antari rings, but also at the same time, Holland is not a terrible person, and he's not out there trying to kill Kel or Lila. And so, that was a wonderful moment that I really, really enjoyed. A few chapters before that, because I forgot, um, another Holland moment, Lila, she goes to follow Alucard out of the pub. We have a little Kel jealousy, and I... I don't know, I like that. But um, yeah, so she follows Alucard at the pub. She's attacked by the copper thieves and it's Holland that finds her. It is Holland that rescues her. And then they have this really dramatic conversation where she still hates him, but she's now indebted to him. He really asks her, at least I remember the amount of people that I've killed. Do you know the number? And she doesn't. And I think that was such a wonderful insight into Holland's character. And it's really what made me root for him. He has not been in control of his actions for the past 20 years but the actions that he did make really intentionally he knows about and he really cares and thinks deeply about and so i really love the insight into holland and one final thing about holland uh, because he did grow on me as a character in this book is that i really like seeing from his point of view when his best friend died because of the dane twins i was like no and it was right after his brother tried to kill him and his lover tried to kill him and it's just been a rough life for holland and so i'm really glad that he's been able to find Maybe not a family with these people, but at least somewhere where he's safe and he's wanted. After we have that dramatic conversation with Holland, we see also a large change in Lila. So yes, she comes to the re same realization that we as readers do, that Holland is a softie at heart. But also at the same time that, you know, she hasn't been too intentional with what she has been doing either. And so she goes back to the cabin and she finds Kel. And so, you know, the, the slow burn is finally like reaching its peak. And then Alucard comes in and he says, stop effing with the ship. And I just, I, I was laughing so hard. I just, it, it's so plausible, right? Like they're both um, really, really powerful Antari, Kel and Lila. And we see how many times Lila tries to control the ocean. And so it just makes sense, but it was just so hilarious. Then after that scene, we find out that Kel is a really good teacher. That's as much as I'll say on that. One thing that I did notice is that the words to of all of the blood spells are so beautiful. You have as Trubaris, as Staron, and then even words like Essentok, you know? It's the word the language itself is just it's so well crafted and it all fits the same vibe. And I don't think it's a Latin root, so if anyone knows how V. E. Schwab came up with those words, please leave a comment down below. I would love to know. I think that it was just a really beautiful language. Final, final things, because this video is getting really, really long. The betrayal by Josta and then Hostra dies, heartbroken. I didn't see it coming. I I had no idea. I really, I believed in Josta. I thought she believed in the cause and it was just really sad when she betrayed them. The betrayal by the Vesks. Again, I wasn't like, why did I take everything at face value? I don't know. I read these books like in two or three days and so I didn't pick up on the subtleties but you know we're being told that the furrowins are the ones playing an attack and so we see the veskins and the veskins are really nice they bring their bird they have the nice daughter the daughter really likes kel and then she really likes rye um that was a bit weird but overall i thought that they were friendly and then we see them betray um each other and i just that broke my heart just a little bit i loved that king Maresh was able to withstand the poison and he did his magic thing i think he really redeemed himself in that sense Maybe not so much in his relationship with Kel, but he did redeem himself and I did like him as a character in A Conjuring of Light. And then we see the brother, uh, the Beskin brother, try to kill the queen. And so one thing that I will say I really appreciated about this scene, not because I wanted her to die, but I did like that the queen died. Because we have Rai stepping in there in the middle and he can't die. And so the prince is so shocked and then he pulls a knife away and... Despite Rai's best efforts, the queen still died. I thought that it was a great way to show that, again, people are not immortal. There is no super powerful, all-natural being. Like, Rai comes close to that, but there are still things that he can't protect. And I really, really appreciated that distinction that V.E. Schwab put in there. Finally, so we wrap this up with Holland. He goes back to White London. Holland's loyalty to White London, it shows throughout all three books, and he just wants to make it a better place. And so I cannot say that by the end of the novel, I wasn't rooting for him. I loved him. I thought it was a beautiful ending for him. And I actually thought it was so appropriate that he went back to White London and he didn't stay in Red London. Um, because in the end, these people never became his family. They were people maybe he could trust or rely on to some degree, but they weren't his family or, or his home, which is what White London was to him. And so finally, we have Lila and Kel going off on their ship. Alucard is staying with Rai. Oh, another romance that I loved. And then 
we see Kel and Rai say goodbye. And then we see Kel get to become free and go with Lila. And he wants to see everything. And there's just like the repeat of the quote. Very beautiful ending. And so yeah, those are all of, well, those are a fraction of my thoughts told to you in a really rambly way. I would love to hear your thoughts about any of these scenes, anything that I didn't bring up. So please leave a comment down below, DM me, shout into the void, anything. I will try my best to respond. If you've made it all the way here to the end of the video, thank you so much for being here and given the topic of this video, I feel like there's only one thing that I can say to end this video. Anosh, thank you for watching.